Welcome to Taiwan Talks. I'm Rath Wang. We must act with greater urgency, were the words of Admiral John Aquilino, commander of the Indo-Pacific Command, America's oldest and largest combined fleet. We'll look at how likely war could erupt around Taiwan, and the U.S. as like-minded democracies work to deter Chinese ambitions. Joining us are William Stanton, former de facto U.S. ambassador to Taiwan, as the director of the American Institute in Taiwan and currently National Zhengzhi University chair professor, and Wen Ti Song, lecturer at Australian National University's Australian Center on China in the World. Wen Ti is a frequent commentator on international media. A warm welcome back to both on the show today. Thanks, it's great to be here. Let's hear what Aquilino said to Congress on a potential Chinese invasion of Taiwan. Uh, for me, it doesn't matter what the timeline is. The secretary can give me this mission today. So I'm responsible to prevent this conflict today. And if deterrence were to fail, to be able to fight and win. The United States military is uh, ready today for any contingency. Ambassador, what can we read from Aquilino's words? Well, I think it's another strong statement of affirmation uh, about Taiwan. Uh, you know, it's accompanied by the recent announcement of harpoon missile sales mm -hmm. uh, to Taiwan, um, by visiting the congressmen, including uh, Kevin McCarthy, uh, the leader of the House, when he came. And we know there was discussion of arms sales and some of the sales that have been promised that have not yet been delivered. Uh, another congressman came and he made the same point that he was going to go back and see what could be done to move forward. So I think all of these recent, uh, our recent signals are really reaffirmations of what we know uh, President Biden has said four times, which is basically the U.S. has a commitment to come to Taiwan's assistance. So I think, you know, we're now actually putting that into action uh, more and more. Putting that into action indeed. Wenti, how committed is the U.S. in Taiwan's defense in a Chinese invasion? I think it's pretty clear by this point that U.S. sees uh, the peace and stability of Taiwan Strait and obviously Taiwan itself as a matter of great international concern. You see that from American statements, uh, both unilaterally, bilaterally, multilaterally, uh, that repeatedly underscore the importance of peace and stability of Taiwan Strait. And naturally, as a leading power of the current uh, rules-based interna international order, you expect U.S. to be willing to play a significant role in terms of maintaining Taiwan's continued uh, security and stability. Ambassador, I wanted to go back to conversations around 2027. It was also mentioned in Aquilino's um, um, Congress um, session. He talked about it, about how his predecessor used that as a date when the PLA will be ready. What are your thoughts on this date? What's the significance? Of I think all these dates that have been floated are really speculative. Um, I think that was premised on possibly the earliest likely that might, something might happen. But, um, you know, I don't think anyone knows. I, at this point, I suspect the Chinese don't even know. And increasingly, as they see strong statements, including from Japan, from the United States, when they see the increasing cooperation between the United States and the Philippines, when they see other activities, it's going to give them pause and think about what the consequences would be. Also, the war, uh, uh, Russian war against Ukraine, continues not to go all that well. So all of these are, uh, are break lights, uh, I think, for, for China to think about what it's doing. Wendy Aquilino also mentioned that he's ensuring that that day is not today referring to a Chinese attack when Xi Jinping might say, okay, today we'll invade Taiwan. What do you feel in terms of what the U.S. is doing? Will China will one day feel, okay, today we can do it? Well, it's, uh, it's anyone's guess, and I, I'll imagine that um, Xi Jinping may not even necessarily know at this point, or even if he does, he might can still change as all humans do. And that's why I think you see the U.S. Indo-PAC uh, commander making a remark to the effect that uh, it's not necessarily uh, U.S. is gonna not going to center its defense planning around 
this particular guess or that particular estimate of what China has in mind in terms of when they plan to launch an invasion. Rather, the focus shouldn't be on that political planning as we do guesswork from the outside. Rather, it should center around trends in China's military capability building over the years. And that's why uh, that commander said that uh, they were going to be accomplishing the mission today, tomorrow, and where, whichever day down the road in the future. But are well. we seeing significant changes in the PLA? Oh, definitely. I mean, we see you. Uh, we see the PLA building its military, building its naval power projection capabilities, especially uh, so much so that many commentators begin to wonder whether the PLA has achieved some level of at least some dimensional uh, conventional superiority in the Taiwan and nearby theater militarily, and that's why it gives U.S. a greater sense of urgency in terms of playing catching up, both qualitatively and quantitatively. Speaking of catching up, Ambassador, you represented the the U.S. for many, many years. Do you feel America is doing enough? Well, because I'm very partial to Taiwan, I would like to see the U.S. always do more. But I think it's taken a number of steps recently we've seen, including, for example, uh, uh, the agreement with the Philippines to open more bases uh, that can be used by U.S. forces. Um, we've also seen, um, I think, statements coming out of Congress showing uh, that it's not only Biden, but it's it's one of the few issues on which both uh, houses, both sides of the Congress, the Democrats and the Republicans, have made statements in support of Taiwan. We've also seen others like Japan saying, you know, I think it was Kishido who said, you know, if it's a problem for Taiwan, it's a problem for uh, for Japan as well. So I think there's been a confluence of opinions and uh, statements and uh, recent developments which indicate that indeed those uh, forces in support of Taiwan are strengthening. In, s in terms of the substantiative measures by the U.S. and Wente, do you feel these four bases that the ambassador mentioned in the Philippines where the U.S. can use it to support Taiwan if it chooses to, is this sufficient for Taiwan's defense? Well, I would say that it's a step in the right direction. Mm. Uh, that's definitely uh, what we're looking at right here. But the and proximity uh, is super close to Taiwan if you look at it from a map. Uh, indeed, I mean, uh, I think that's why what U.S. security plan has been about uh, recently as well. They're trying to boost their access to Japanese uh, military facility and now to Filipino uh, security facilities. And when you have AUKUS kicking in a few years time, uh, in a more substantive way, of course, you will see U.S. Uh, nuclear submarines based in Australia on the more, well, not based in technically, but be having a rotational presence uh, in Australia as well. Again, this is all about extending U.S. extended deterrence in the Indo-Pacific And the submarine deal as well. That's certainly a major part of it, yes. And that will, of course, not only increase America's immediate presence itself, but also increases the capability of other like-minded allies, such as Australia, that have a role to play in the regional uh, stability maintenance as well. Bases are an important step because otherwise a foreign minister of China would not be visiting the Philippines to complain about it. So obviously they're upset about it and would attempt to... Uh, and get the uh, Filipinos to draw back. So, Ambassador, you see that as a sign, a positive sign, that China is reacting. I, I think it's very positive. Um, uh, they didn't, uh, when Duterte was president and basically said, oh, we're, we're going to have a love affair with China, um, you didn't see that kind of attention to the Philippines. In a sense, um, Marcos, the current president, has learned the lesson when he saw the results of Duterte's, um, uh, you know, uh, friendship offering to the Chinese, they just took advantage of it, and they never delivered it on their promises for a lot of money. But China also seems to react to many things. Do you feel this is because of the substantial effect, or is it because of um, the symbolic gesture that it always reacts on? I think it's both. I mean. I think they like to, uh, anything they don't like and they see happening, they're always going to speak up about it. But to get the foreign minister to visit the Philippines, I think is a little bit more than that. It's more than just a statement coming out of Beijing. So I think, I think they are really uh, a bit concerned about the current trend that's occurring in East Asia.
Wente, I also wanted to go back to what you mentioned earlier on Australia. This is the first time that, or its role has been inflated in terms of the military drills. Do you feel this will change the dynamics? As we've seen, you know, the U.S. joint military drills with the Philippines, Australia actually was a part of it. Yeah, there was an Australian uh, contingent, uh, Australian regiment rather, that participated in this round of exercises, exercise shoulder to shoulder between U.S. and Philippines. And uh, yeah, again, you're seeing Australia being one of the, if you will, sovereign anchor of America's Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, having its presence felt more in the northern part of the Pacific, uh, with a very likely uh, target in mind, and that is to increase its ability to play a positive role in maintaining, uh, hopefully, deterring a Taiwan Strait contingency from ever happening. And that's why you see Australia playing more and more role here. You also see Australia uh, with Japan, for example, uh, you see them in their Australia-Japan 2 plus 2 security consultative meetings between their ministers, where they both commit to, again, saying the, how they highlight and underscore the importance of peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. This is something that's a recent development. You only begin to see it over the last year or two, really. So that's a sign that not only the U.S. itself is trying to play a more active role, but also other leading U.S. allies and partners trying to chip in as well on the Taiwan Strait contingency issue. Do you feel that Australia can actually surprise China by this move? Do you feel that China is actually um, taken back because of the support that we've seen from allies for Taiwan? I would say that China was likely taken back uh, last year, especially. So you see them begin to try to change gears in terms of how they go about uh, managing relations with other U.S. allies and partners in Europe, especially, but also in other parts of the West, mm -hmm. namely Australia. Mm -hmm. We see them trying to, let's say, for 2020, 2021, a lot of time is about China using a killing a chicken to scare the monkey mm -hmm. strategy, trying to make example of countries like Australia, which might have rubbed Beijing the wrong way, e.g. on Taiwan issue. So it was a lot of fire fear rhetoric, including economic sanctions from China towards Australia. But after a couple of years, China probably realized it's not scaring off any more monkeys anymore. So by that point, they may as well change track. So you see them reaching out to Australia a bit more, and you're beginning to see uh, Australia talking more softly towards, uh, sorry, China speaking more softly. Uh, towards Australia lately. That's why we see like um, the um, relax of sanctions towards Australia and uh, agricultural products. And all I, that. I mean, I was very struck by Penny Wong, the foreign minister of Australia, very strong statement saying, well, in a, f in a sense, our relationship with uh, the United States is indispensable. And she was criticized from the left for making that statement. Uh, there was a long... Uh, a long op-ed mm -hmm. that was written attacking her, uh, which interestingly enough quoted uh, Kevin Rudd. Uh, Kevin Rudd himself has always been a bit wary of uh, this relationship with the United States. So that had a certain audience, I'm sure, but Penny Wong didn't pull any punches in saying that we have to have this strong relationship with the United States. And then we also saw um, after the Macron visit, uh, you know, uh, to Beijing and his strong statements uh, basically, well, we're not, you know, we're not uh, a tail being wagged by the American dog in effect. Um, we then saw the parliamentarians in France as well as in Germany come out with a statement of support for the alliance with the United States. So I think, you know, those who have gotten out of line in a sense with the idea of unity of the alliance, I think they've they've come under criticism now. And you could say that Macron actually walked back a part of its um, what he said in terms of Taiwan and saying that French policy towards Taiwan has not changed. Yeah, a little bit, but um, we know where his heart is because uh, <laughs> you know I I, I think um, you know no surprise I think he's no fan of the United States. He's also. Um, no fan of the idea that France might have to give support as an ally of uh, NATO ally in the event there were a conflict with China. So I, I think his true colors have already been shown, uh, but yeah, maybe you could say he walked it back a little bit. 
but I don't think his true feelings have been hidden. We'll see what happens with France and other U.S. allies. Let's now hear from Eric Huang, Deputy Director of Taiwan's largest opposition party, the KMT's International Affairs Department. Huang is currently based in Washington, D.C. Eric, the U.S. Indo-Pacific commander, Aquilino, mentioned that the U.S. must be ready to prepare to fight in a Taiwan conflict. How do you read his comments? I think he has stated obvious. I think America, whether it is in the European arena or into Indo-Pacific uh, place at the area, I think the United States is always ready um, to fight and defend democracy against any uh, challenger of international order. Uh, I think what is more interesting is that he uh, stressed the fact that ta uh, Taiwan, in Taiwan Strait, uh, America has to be prepared. I think this is just a reaction to the reason um, in the past few years, the Chinese aggression towards Taiwan and uh, its military activities in Taiwan Strait. Being in Washington, do you feel that U.S.-China tensions have come to a boiling point? I think we're definitely at a tipping point. I wouldn't. I don't know if we are the boiling point yet. I I can see some people slamming the brake. I can see some um, some scholars and alike uh, try to cool down this tension. And I think uh, the Biden administration and Xi Jinping, Beijing, they uh, both have intentions of doing so. However, we have to see other elements of this, uh, i.e., in the business world. Uh, I think you know the reason TikTok congressional hearing is a good example of that. Uh, U.S. U.S.-China competition is not just strategic; it's not just military government to government. You can also see the business element. You know how TikTok and Facebook they are competitors. We've also seen additional sanctions announced against Chinese firms that are working with Russia. What do you read to that? I think the United States has been very clear. I don't know. This part of the free world, we stand together, we unite as one, uh, standing behind the Ukrainians, fighting the Russian aggression. I think the Chinese has to understand that in this fight, you're either with the democracy or you're not. So I think America is now uh, putting more sanctions in place to help the Ukrainians fight this fight. I think this is also a reassurance to people in Taiwan that America stands with us, stand with democracy, and we will fight together against any aggression in the world. Amid all these different conflicts around the world, what implications does this have for Taiwan? I know you mentioned that um, it's a good sign, positive sign, that the U.S. is supporting democracy and Taiwan. I think we're past the stage of just uh, having the United States to def, uh, to to uh, support democracy and to be a um, security guarantor. I think this is a point that U.S. Taiwan has to uh, work together uh, closer. You know, we recently read from the news that uh, U.S. military are sending uh, sergeants uh, to AIT. I think these are all, um, you know, good steps towards the right direction. I think that uh, implication for Taiwan is that uh, Taiwan's status, uh, even though is still murky in the international community, but uh, Taiwan's situation is well understood, and Taiwan's predicament are uh, somewhat guaranteed by the Western allies. I think now Taiwan has to. Uh, grow our self-confidence and understand that uh, we need to do more among ourselves. There's been a delay in arms for Taiwan. Do you feel with this sense of urgency, there will be a speeding up of arms or more arms for Taiwan? Uh, I think Taiwan and the United States are working together to do whatever it takes under a magical strategy. Um, under this strategy, Taiwan will get the weapons he need and Taiwan understand what it takes to do it. Um, the military backlog here in the United States is not intentional. Uh, the military backlog is predominantly uh, caused by um, Russia's invasion to Ukraine. And the United States has to supply a lot of weaponary systems uh, to Ukraine. 
But however, uh, we are confident because we have heard now that the DOD is working with the Taiwan's government to put in programs in place to manufacture and to put in um, <clears throat> assembly lines for the weapons that Taiwan very, very much in need. Huang Xilian, China's ambassador to the Philippines, accused the Philippines that opening up military bases for the U.S. military is fueling flames in the Taiwan Strait. Wenti, apart from the military exercises, do you see China intimidating or using means other than military in scaring the Philippines? I think um, likely China is going to use a combination of both carrots and sticks in this scenario. Uh, the obviously economic charm offensive is always going to be a favorite uh, go-to item in the toolbox, so to speak, especially with a strong uh, overseas Chinese presence uh, in the Filipino community as well, playing a potentially significant role in Filipino politics. So that's a natural draw. And you combine that with be a diplomatic censure, be a some potential targeted economic sanction item against some sector of Filipino. Uh, economy, that's always going to be a possibility uh, when it comes to how China manages relation with middle powers like Philippines. Ambassador, how much do you feel this is effective in terms of convincing the Marcos Jr. administration? Is it going to work? Uh, you know, um, I think people sometimes underestimate the Filipinos that um, they think they can say anything and get away with it. Um, you know, I think that uh, in a way, you can push Filipinos a little bit, but then they get their backs up and they can be very strong in reaction to what people are saying. And, and we've seen that in a way at the very end of his tenure, uh, uh, Duterte was very unhappy with the way he'd been treated by the Chinese, promises that have been unfulfilled. And um, I think they've also, you know, you may want to talk about this, um, you know, they've been basically threatening the Filipinos who are overseas. And, you know, having lived six years of my life in China, I can say Filipinos were not particularly well treated um, in, uh, in China, nor were others who were considered sort of a, an inferior class of domestic workers and people who were taking jobs that the Chinese themselves didn't want. So I think this kind of superior attitude that China carries, particularly as it's become more prosperous, is not a winning hand when you're dealing with countries like the Philippines or countries from Southeast Asia, like the way you deal with the Vietnamese and other countries which now currently supply a good bit of the, a good number of the domestic workers and, uh, and factory workers in, in countries like China. Wendy, how do you feel the Filipinos or even the Filipino administration is taking the unveiled threat that, that the Chinese ambassador said in terms of the 150,000 Filipino workers in Taiwan. I don't think that message is going to come across very well at all uh, for China. And uh, naturally, when China tried to threaten other countries with such diplomatic rhetoric, uh, it may be effective if you're able to single out the country at the time, but the challenge for China right now is that it's rubbed quite a number of countries the wrong way uh, by this point, and there's no real way that China can take on so many adversaries at the same time. So that means that China diplomatic threat now is increasingly going through somewhat of a credibility gap, if you will, because it can credibly take on everyone at the same time, and yet in many ways that's what it has been doing. And when everyone's been going through that together, it gives it a lot more reason, both for domestic political reasons as well as foreign policy reasons. It gives them reason to bank together great, uh, a lot more. And that gives them security number, which make China diplomatic language a lot less effective when it comes to intimidation. And that's what said it better. <laughs> yeah, I mean, once he actually said what I would have said, I think he, he and there's no need to repeat that. <laughs> to add on that, do you feel that they're actually is a sentiment for Taiwan because um, anti-sentiment on China will translate to Taiwan. Do I think it does. Um, you know, one of the things that everybody recognizes about the Taiwanese is that they're basically peaceful people. And the Filipinos uh, see that. And the Filipinos see that. And, um, you know, you, you don't see violence, you don't see, uh, anger, angry outbursts, you know. And you're talking about the South China Sea, how China's going in and yeah. doing things in, that seem to be un, 
unwelcome to the Philippines. Yeah, and so, you know, they're treating the Filipinos the way they treat the, the Taiwanese. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a history, actually, in the South China Sea of Coast Guard boats and then fishing boats disguised or that have been named part of a militia, basically, that comes under the PLA, ramming fishing boats of of uh, Vietnamese. You can go online and see cases where they've sunk Filipino fishing vessels. Um, they've raised them up, they've taken the catch, and then they've asked the Filipino uh, s staff who survived to sign Chinese documents saying they were responsible for what had happened. And with the um, recent razor nuclear light lighting and all that, there has been a protest. Yeah, there was a protest. So, the, you know, they fired the laser light uh, into a ship. You know, it was a Coast Guard, uh, a Filipino Coast Guard ship. So if you treat people like that, it makes everybody angry and everybody says, me too. That's how they treated us as well. So uh, as Wendy has pointed out, I think there becomes a consolidated opinion among many neighbors that, you know, the Chinese have a habit of bullying everyone and it's, it's not working very well anymore. And Wendy, so that comes to Qin Gang, the Chinese foreign minister's trip to the Philippines. What do you think he aims to achieve here? Uh, presumably he's going to go there, use a pretty high bureaucratic, statical, uh, bureaucratic protocol, if you will, as a deputy national level official from China to pay this significant visit to Philippines as a way to show how I value you, please calm down and uh, let's, let's uh, review our bridges. Do you think he could come in with more, say, economic um, incentives for the Philippines or do you feel that's off the table? Uh, that depends on who he brings with him to the Philippines on his delegation. If it's got people from the more NDRC, uh, which is more macroeconomic planning agency, or the more commerce department kind of people, presumably some kind of economic goodies could be in the offing. But if it doesn't, if it's just mostly foreign ministry portfolio people that go with him, then it's hard to expect there to be much more than a symbolic gesture uh, to the whole trip. Ambassador, do you feel that with Qin Gang in the Philippines, could that sway the U.S.-Philippine alliance, or do you feel it's rock solid? I don't think a visit by a single official from the PRC is going to make that huge a difference. Um, is he going to take back the words and the threats that have already been made against the Philippines? Is he going to say, well, we're really not going to endanger the 150,000 Filipinos who, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're not threatening them? I mean, once you make a strong threat, it's not that easy to walk it back and still retain face. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, he may say things along the lines of, you know, if you respond more positively, we will be able to respond more positively to you. But in a way, that train already left the station because that was tried uh, during the tenure of Duterte and the Chinese never lived up to their commitments. So I don't think he's got a very, he doesn't have a lot of cards in his hand. We also see Marcos Jr. visiting the US. What do you feel will come out of this? Do you feel China will be top on the table? Yeah, if I may add one more thing to the ambassador's comment just now. Um, yeah, I think it's definitely a, a concern there uh, when it comes to Qin Gang's trip to the Philippines because a traditional rhetoric that China diplomacy uses a lot is uh, let's look past our differences, let's rebuild a positive atmosphere for exchanges. And pretend that nothing happened. Yeah, and when they say that, it's usually saying, hey, how about you give an inch so that I can give an inch two and reciprocate and we get a sort of positive virtuous cycle rolling. But that still is basically saying, how about you make the first concession? Now, at this point, after China just made that kind of comment to the Filipino people, it's hard to see Filipinos making the first concession by this point. Uh, it's hard to see any Filip po Filipino politician to be in a place to feel comfortable politically to be the one to be seen as caving in to a Chinese threat. So what would be the first concession if the Philippines were to make it? You said it's difficult. The first concession at this point, it's pretty hard to imagine really. Mm -hmm. A concession would be something like a statement to the effect of we still value the, the vibrancy of Philippine-China relations. We are willing to work 
over our differences, differences and bridge our differences and find ways to work together towards some joint prosperity. Although Something the foreign like minister that. did say that he adheres to the one China policy. Uh, yeah, as Filipino define it, of course, and <laughs> that's the second hat that can be left on set for, again, maintaining that positive atmosphere for dialogue, mm -hmm. quote unquote. Ambassador, what do you think? You've been in the area for decades. At this point, the Filipinos can do very much. Um, as Wanti said, I think they might be willing to make some sort of statement about, uh, of course, they seek uh, peace with all their neighbors. They're not looking for an adversarial relationship. They might repeat that they support the one China policy, but of course that always implies as we interpret it. Because it, the United States also says it has a one China policy uh, that's pro forma, and then we say, yeah, and we're sending more uh, arms to Taiwan. So, you know, in a way, a lot of the rhetoric surrounding what kind of a relationship everybody has with, with the Chinese, it's all just words increasingly and increasingly meaningless. Um, and, you know, if you wanted to have certain words, we should go back and look at the 72 communique the first joint statement between China and the United States in which the Chinese said uh, big countries should not bully small countries. Um, China does not seek to be a hegemon. I mean, the whole statement that Chinese side stated has all proved to be just words. They haven't lived up to any of it. I think they also said if they don't, then they expect the world to come and call them out. Absolutely. <laughs> So I have the text with me if you want me to read some of it. Yeah, if you could talk a bit about that so that our well, international audience can understand better. The Chinese side stated, this is 1972, wherever there is oppression, there is resistance. Countries want independence. Countries want liber nations want liberation. And the people want revolution. This has become the irresistible trend of history. All nations, big or small, should be equal. Big nations should not bully the small and strong nations should not bully the weak. China will never be a superpower and it opposes hegemony and power politics of any kind. The Chinese side stated that it firmly supports the struggles of all oppressed people and nations for freedom and liberation and that the people of all countries have the right to choose their social systems according to their own wishes and the right to safeguard the independence, sovereignty, and territorial integrity of their own countries and oppose foreign aggression, interference, control, and subversion. Wenti, how do we interpret the ambassadors, what he just read in the Taiwan context? Right. Uh, obviously, at that point, if you're talking about 1972, that's when China was trained to get into the UN. Uh, well, actually, I haven't just made it into the UN uh, as a PRC. So I guess Taiwan may not be as directly involved with that statement per se, but what it does suggest is that when China, the PRC, was in a position of relative weakness in terms of power level, if you will, it was trying to reassure the world that, hey, how about you help me out, and that when one day I become strong, I will be a benevolent power rather than another one of those strong guys that will bully and throw my weight around. Do you feel it's yeah. acted as a benevolent ruler or a benevolent party in this case? I think that would be a topic of major contention for sure. Uh, what I can say is that in 2010, if I believe correctly, uh, then the it was the foreign minister at the time, Yang Jiechi, who said at a meeting of ASEAN uh, to something to the effect of uh, China is a big country and ASEAN and Southeast Asia are smaller countries. That's just a fact, quote unquote. Uh, the ASEAN Regional Forum attended by Hillary Clinton mm -hmm. and uh, Yang Jiechur got up and walked out of the meeting after uh, the U.S. representative, who was Hillary Clinton, uh, made a statement to the effect that the United States uh, hoped for a multilateral um, joint agreement on the handling of the South China Sea. Mm -hmm. And at that point, a uh, very infuriated uh, uh, Yang Jiechur got up and walked out of the room and didn't return for 20 minutes when he sat down, and I, I know because I reported on this, he looked across the table where the Singaporean representative was sitting, and he said, some countries are big, 
and other countries are small, and that's just a fact. <laughs> it's interesting how things have changed. How, how the world has changed. So be careful what you say in 1972, because some years later, you won't think the same anymore. We fast forward to 2023 now. I spoke earlier to Gerald De Pippo, Senior Fellow with the Economics Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. He focuses on China and joined CSIS after 11 years in the U.S. intelligence community. Gerald, the U.S. announced new sanctions on Chinese companies that have links to Russia. What effect will this have on U.S.-China relations? So that latest tranche of sanctions that was announced was aimed at five uh, PRC or Hong Kong domiciled companies, but it was also a lot of other companies. I think there were over 100 entities in total with, um, I've lost track, but a lot of different countries were involved. The point of those sanctions is basically to plug the holes in the export controls regime aimed at Russia. So with any export control regime, there's typically um, what's called leakage, right? So eventually you find workarounds. And I think a big focus of the G7 sanctions aimed at Russia now is, is plugging the holes in that leakage. And that's what this tranche was about. It was not aimed specifically at China per se. It was just aimed at entities that were seen as violating the export controls, often through intermediaries, going through UAE, et cetera. In terms of the economic impact, um, you know, it's, it's, it's probably negligible overall for China. It's not a really big deal. In terms of U.S.-China relations, um, it's just, you know, another, another stone on the pile. The, the foreign ministry in China announced, you know, of course, a statement condemning this, saying it was without any international legal basis, et cetera. That's standard practice. What issues do you see in the U.S.-China relations now that you feel is actually concerning or alarming? There are mutual beliefs of fatalism on both sides, meaning that neither side is really internalizing how its actions are affecting perceptions on the other side and then triggering another reaction from, from the other side. Uh, I think they're, they've got into a cycle of sort of mutual escalation or eroding the status quo, depending on what you're talking about, but including over Taiwan in a mutual sense, but neither side wants to say that they're doing that. I think Taiwan is is a major, perhaps the biggest actually bilateral issue, if at least when you get say one to two degrees removed. Um, I think you know fundamentally in the US, the view is that China has not reformed in the direction that people were hoping about a decade ago. A lot of that blame has been aimed at Xi Jinping, fairly or not, although you know part of that was pre-existing. Uh, there's a lot of complaints about China's unfair economic practices, uh, but there are a lot of other issues like human rights violations, uh, the South China Sea, uh, technology transfer issues, concerns about uh, potential Chinese government manipulation of technology apps like TikTok, which is a major issue in the United States. I mean, the list goes on and on. With all these tensions, do you see decoupling coming at full speed? And what role do you feel Taiwan can play? I wouldn't say it's full steam ahead, but if you're looking over, say, a five to 10 year time frame, I think the economic relationship between the U.S. and China is going to look a fair amount different. Um, Taiwan is central in those concerns. Um, a lot of this comes, the, the geopolitical risk talk is often centered on, on cross-strait issues. How vulnerable is Taiwan? Is the PLA going to invade Taiwan in the extreme case? And of course, the fact that, that the world is so overwhelmingly dependent on Taiwan, TSMC in particular, for high-end semiconductor chips, um, I, it's, it's obviously very difficult to replace those chips. They're, they're the most expensive and you know, most valuable in the world and hard to replicate. But there are gradual efforts to try to boost resiliency, boost production overseas. Some of it is onshoring in the United States with the CHIPS Act. The Europeans have their own version of the CHIPS Act. Um, I think, you know, Taiwan is kind of the locus of a lot of these concerns because of, of its centrality in, in global technology supply chains. How effective is China dividing the West? I would say China is mostly unsuccessful. I think when, when you ask the question, probably implicit in that is, is Macron's visit to China recently. Um, I, I think, you know, part of that was... The, the traditional French role of wanting to be an ind independent power, having the idea of strategic autonomy, it goes back to, to Charles de Gaulle, frankly. Um, I, I don't think that China's efforts per se were instrumental in that. It's more of just 
uh, how the French or Macron wants to see themselves. But actually, it's quite interesting because the response to that and, for example, the German foreign minister's more recent visit to, to China have demonstrated there's still um, a fair amount of alignment between in the transatlantic relationship with regard to China and the Taiwan issue. I mean, I think in general, the U.S. is um, a little more hawkish and more explicitly worried about it. But I think there is a broad consensus of, of, of worry about China's behavior. And I, to that, I would cite the, the recent G7 foreign minister statement, which reiterated the importance of peace and stability and cross-strait relations. In the long run, how concerned should Taiwan be, given different voices, even though you mentioned that fundamentally things haven't changed? In the long run, I think Taiwan should be very concerned. Um, I, I don't believe that Xi Jinping has a definite plan or timeline for, quote, reunification uh, with with Taiwan. I do think that in the long run, I mean, the, if you could say there's a deadline, it's arguably 2049, which is really not that far away. It's just one generation away. Um, that would be sort of the end goal. Um, I, I, I think that, you know, that China says that it's still open to sort of various types of reconciliation. There's still some talk of one country, two systems. I would think Hong Kong would demonstrate that that's not really plausible. Uh, but but I think if you're looking past, say, a five year time frame, I think Taiwan should treat it as an existential risk and one that both sides of the Pacific should do their best to avoid making a reality. And I think that actually should be a central uh, impulse of U.S. policy should be to prevent the worst case scenario. Let's try to kick the can down the road as far as possible. But from Taiwan's perspective, yeah, I mean, I would take the the risk from from the mainland very seriously. So how alarming is 2027? Uh, I know you mentioned 2049. So 2027 uh, was, I think, initially mischaracterized by certain U.S. military officials as being a deadline. It's actually a timeline for making the PLA ready for forceful reunification or war with, over Taiwan. It is not a statement of intent. It doesn't mean that there's, act, you know, that come January 1st, 2027, the missiles start flying. I, I, I don't believe that. I'm I'm more worried. Um, I'm less worried about there being a sort of um, definite planned, uh, you know, deliberately started operation from China against Taiwan. I'm more worried about China reacting or overreacting to perceived provocations from Taiwan or the United States. So I think the the risk of accidental conflict uh, over time is is probably quite high. Uh, I think in the medium ish term, I, I don't I'm I'm not expecting. China to, to just, you know, roll the dice and go for it. Hello, I'm Rath Wang. If you liked our show, please search for us on YouTube. Give us a thumbs up and hit subscribe to our channel. Feel free to leave us any feedback in the comment section. The U.S. is Taiwan's largest security guarantor, as Taiwanese conscription is extended to a year with the boost of U.S. personnel training, Taiwanese combat troops. Wenti, I wanted to ask you, how immediate do you feel this will have an effect on Taiwan's de deterrence capabilities? Well, when it comes to Taiwan's capability and deterrence, really there are two components to it. One of it is the actual military capability, the other one is more diplomatic signaling. The military capability part, it will take a little while for the military training to be fully implemented, fully immersed, and then pass on to the next generation and next tier of uh, and then the next crops of soldiers, if you will. So that would take a little while, but it's always good to be starting now rather than later. That's one thing. The other thing is about diplomatic messaging. And on that, I think that will have a significant effect right there. Uh, that's a sign, again, of U.S. commitment to Taiwan's defense. And uh, that's also a way of improving the interoperability of the forces between Taiwan and U.S. and potentially other regional partners through this process. And this kind of thing will likely improve the capability uh, in the time of conflict. And hopefully then before the conflict, the very sending of this signal will go some way towards deterring and dissuading other actors from making risky gambles on Taiwan. Ambassador, you led the AIT as America's top envoy in Taiwan. Do you feel that this is a significant um, increase of troops here? Do you feel it will be very effective? Well, I, I think actually it's the reason we have more troops coming in is because it's a requirement that the U.S. military imposes. If you're going to give people new weapons, you have to give them guidance on using those weapons, on maintaining those weapons. And so it's sort of natural 
that if new weapons are coming into a country, there is going to be some U.S. troops that are going to go along with it. I think it's not, the idea is not that those 200 troops are actually going to be fighting. Uh, that's not exactly Oh, the they're goal. training Taiwanese troops in they're combat. They're training the tra Taiwanese tr troops to fight. So I wouldn't make too much of uh, the 200 troops, although China's talked about it as if those are forces that are being added uh, to the Taiwan military. I think that's a misreading of what the situation is. I think the most important thing is that we continue to provide weapons to Taiwan that it needs, and then that we provide the training forces to go with it to help them know how to use and maintain those weapons, uh, so and to use them most effectively. Um, you know, I think more significant is simply the fact that Tsai Ing-wen made the decision that she was going to um, undo what I regard as a mistake that was made by Ma Yingzhou when he reduced conscription from one year to four months, which all the young men that I've ever spoken to at different universities have always said, if they've been conscripted, that a four-month conscription is really sort of laughable because there's too little that can be learned in that period of time. So that's the more significant development as new troops begin to join the Taiwan military, hopefully they'll get the kind of training they need to be a more effective force. Wente, I wanted to go to a recent comment by both the UK foreign minister and also the president of South Korea saying that Taiwan conflict or war or some kind of military outbreak within the Taiwan Strait is not in a Chinese internal matter. What do you say to that? I think that's how they strike a balance between finding a way for a greater international involvement on the Taiwan Strait issue. Does that also mean there's more support for Taiwan? Of course. Uh, I think that's, that's pretty much the, the main message that's trying to, to send. And of course, these actors, these other countries, they always want to find a balance between showing support for Taiwan by drawing in more international involvement without directly crossing Beijing's red line, in, uh, quote unquote, uh, internationalization of a Taiwan issue. So that's why I think they're saying uh, whatever happens in Taiwan and uh, around Taiwan Strait is going to have global level uh, reverberation and that's why stakeholders around the globe will have a natural reason and interest to become more involved in shaping or preventing particular outcomes. And that's how I think they find a way into uh, making more engagement of Taiwan and Taiwan Strait issues. Ambassador, I wanted to point to a recent comment by the Chinese ambassador to France that he questions the sovereignty of foreign Soviet republics. What does this mean in terms of the context of Taiwan? Well, in a sense, he's opening up the, uh, the sovereignty of every nation in the world up to question. Because we could also ask, um, you know, by what right did, uh, did the Soviet Union at one point control Belarus and then decide it could be broken off?